Okay, so our next section here with the senses is on vision. And the first thing we're going to do is actually take a look at our anatomy of the eye and the eye region through a couple of diagrams. So let me get my pen set up here. Oops. Erase that. All right, so what we have here is an external view of the eye, and we want to look at a couple of um, features of the eye as well as some structures that are in and around the eye. And the first one here are these items, and these are the eyelashes. The eyelashes are attached, both top and bottom, to the eyelid. And the, with the eye itself, we have the white part of the eye, which is called the sclera, the pigmented part of the eye, which is called the iris, and then the black part of the eye, which is actually a hole in the iris that changes size, which is our pupil. Now with the eyelids, we have two locations where the upper and lower lids come together. One is here at the side, and this is called the lateral canthus. And the other one is here on the inside, which is called the medial canthus. Next to the medial canthus is this red piece of tissue here, which we'll talk about its function in a little bit. And this is the lacrimal caruncle. The other piece is this purple here, and this is the lacrimal gland. Now the only other thing I like to point out, even though we won't get into the names of the structures, is that this actually shows with the, the purple items here that the nose and the eye are actually connected. And this is one of the reasons why when you cry, your nose actually runs. Um, some of the tears actually flow into those ducts and out through your nose when you cry. So our second diagram for vision actually takes the um, eye and cuts it on a sagittal section. So let's take a look at those structures. The first structure here is the ciliary body. Attached underneath the ciliary body are some string-like projections that are called the suspensory ligaments. The next line down is kind of a flap that extends from the ciliary body down over the suspensory ligaments, and that is your iris. The next part actually is pointing to the whole area there in front of the iris, and this is the anterior chamber or anterior cavity. Either one is fine. The next one is pointing to the lens which is very important for our vision. And the last one on this side details from this point on the eye to up here, and that is your cornea. Moving over to the other side, the top line is pointing to the whole big area at the back, which is the posterior cavity or the posterior chamber. Again, either term is fine. The next area right here is referring to a region called the optic disc. Now in the next segment, it's kind of hard to see, so I'm going to draw it here. You actually have this membrane that comes down, and then there's this little divot there. The next line is actually pointing or tagging that divot there, which is called the fovea. The fovea is the center for our visual axis. Might help if I could spell it correctly. Visual axis. It comes in and ends at the fovea. 
the next point on here actually refers to everything else on the outside of the eye except for the cornea, and that is your sclera. The middle layer, which lies underneath the sclera, is the choroid. And then the last inner layer is your retina, which you have probably have heard of before. So those are the basics in terms of the structure of the eye. So now what we can do is actually take a look at the function. We're going to start with the accessory structures. And these are structures that are not actually part of the eye, but they help the eye function in its correct manner. So the first one of these is the palpebrae, or the eyelid. This is basically a continuation of the skin with a mucous membrane on the inside. The eyelids function as windshield wipers with lubrication and removal of debris. The eyelash is the next accessory structure and it functions, uh, its structure is made up of just simply robust hairs. These function to help prevent dirt and insects from contacting our eye surface. So while um, our blink reflex is actually pretty quick, sometimes, especially when it's very unexpected, um, we can actually catch things in our eyelashes that um, may normally have made contact with the eye itself, which could also cause damage to those tissues. The lacrimal caruncle is a soft mass of tissue which contains glands. And these glands produce a thick secretion that helps to lubricate the eye. Now from time to time, these secretions actually kind of leak out of the eye, especially when we are sleeping. And they kind of become that crusty material. My, my family, we always called it sleep in the eye. So you, you just kind of brush those away and, and they're not harmful. They're not indicating anything. It's just the, the, the extra secretions from that eye that have dehydrated. The final accessory structure is the lacrimal gland. This is a gland tissue that has about a dozen ducts that empty into the pocket between the lid and the eye. They function to produce tears, so these are the ones that are right up above your eyebrow, and they also lubricate and moisten the eye. Now we have a couple of diseases and disorders that are associated with these accessory structures. The first is a sty. And a sty is caused by an infection of the glands around the eye. Now, sometimes this infection gets taken care of just fine by our immune system, but sometimes you do need medications in order to uh, get over this. Um, you get very painful swelling of them, and they put pressure on the eye, and it's, it's actually a condition which is very painful for the person. The second one is conjunctivitis. And conjunctivitis is damage or irritation to the inner surface of the eyelid or the outer surface of the eye. These two areas taken together are known as the conjunctiva. So itis means inflammation of, and then the conjunctiva part, so inflammation of the conjunctiva. Its symptoms include redness of the eye, which leads it to its more common name, which is pink eye. Now, conjunctivitis can be brought on by a number of things, a virus, it can also be bought on by stress or even a bacteria. Um, doctors can prescribe medications for conjunctivitis, but you can also treat them with um, cold, warm compresses on the eyes, um, you know, especially ones that are related to stress or the viral type. Now, moving on to the eye itself, let's look at some of its general characteristics. The eye itself is round and hollow. It's about two and a half centimeters in diameter and has a mass of about 8 grams. Now, this tissue is very, very delicate, which is one of the reasons why it's protected on most sides by bone. But we also have to protect the eye from damage by the bone itself, kind of like what we have to do with the brain. So it is surrounded, cushioned, and insulated by a mass of fat. There's actually a um, pad of fat that it sits on so that when we're standing upright, the um, eye receives a lot of nice cushioning inside of the skull. So let's take a look at the structures of the eye itself. The first one is the sclera. It is the white portion of the eye that is made up of dense fibrous connective tissue. It allows us to insert our eye muscles, which allow us to move our eyes without moving our head. And it also carries blood vessels and nerves that supply the eye. 
The cornea is made up of collagen fibers that are arranged in such a way that they are transparent. The cornea is clear because it allows passage of light into the eye. The combination of the sclera and the cornea make out the complete outer, outer layer of the eye. So given that the sclera is white and it's opaque, light can't pass through it. Um, and that's important because it keeps the, the dark areas of our eye dark by not allowing light. But we need to get light in in order for us to see, and that's what the cornea allows to happen. The ciliary body is made up of smooth muscle, and it functions to hold the lens and change the shape of the lens. The choroid, which is the layer just beneath the sclera, is a capillary network layer, and it functions to separate the fibrous tunic, and we'll talk about the fibrous tunic here in a minute, and from the retina. It delivers oxygen and nutrients to the retina. And as we'll learn, the retina contains a lot of nervous tissue. And as we know, nervous tissue needs a lot of oxygen and nutrients to meet its high biological and metabolic demands. So um, without this layer, our retina would essentially die. The next structure is the macula lutea, and this literally means yellow circle. It is an area where we have a very high concentration of photoreceptors that we call cones. This is where the visual image arrives at the back of our eyes. The fovea is that divot that we talked about on the diagram. This is a shallow depression that happens within the macula lutea. Of the eye, it has the highest cone concentration. So this is an area that is the center for our color vision and also gives us our sharpest possible vision when we focus our visual image there at the fovea. The optic disc is a circular area at the back of the eye, which is the origin of the optic nerve. Now, unlike most of the rest of the inside of the eye, at the optic disc there is no photoreceptors. So this creates our blind spot. This allows the axons of the ganglion cells to leave our eye to form that optic nerve, and it allows blood vessels to both enter and exit the eye um, without creating a new place where we would have a problem. The last one on that chart is the iris. The iris is composed of blood vessels, pigment cells, loose connective tissue, and two layers of smooth muscle. It functions to change the diameter of the pupil, which is the opening in the iris that allows light into the eye. So let's take a closer look at the iris. Specifically what we're going to do is take a look at those two layers of smooth muscle with this diagram. So what we've done is we've taken away the colored portion of the eye and only left behind the smooth muscle. So looking at the, the arrow down below, at this end we have a dim light condition. And at this end we have a bright light condition. And as you can see in the bright light we have a pupil that is very small and in the dim light we have pupils that are very large. And that is because of the interaction of the two muscle layers. The outer layer of muscle is called the dilators, whereas the inner muscle layer is referred to as the constrictors. So let's deal with the um, dim light situation first. Well, actually, let me back up. You can notice here that the dilators, the muscle fibers run this way on the dilators, whereas with the constrictors, they kind of go in a circular fashion around the eye. And that actually dictates a little bit how they function. In a dim light scenario, the dilators are contracted and the constrictors are relaxed. When muscles are relaxed, they're very um, kind of wiggly, I guess. Um, they're, they're loose. So 
um, if you look here at this distance over here, you can see that this distance is actually shorter. And that's typical of contraction. So it's actually literally pulling the constrictors out away from the center. And because the constrictors are kind of stretchy, since they are relaxed, they're able to do that to open up the pupil very wide. In the opposite scenario, um, with the bright light, my dilators are actually relaxed, which causes them to lengthen. Um, so the longer they are, obviously, the more space they take up. And my constrictors contract. And as they contract, as you can see here, they really thicken. And that creates the smaller opening of the pupil than what we have um, in the other scenario. Now, obviously, these are the two extremes, and all along the mi middle range of um, light exposure, we have, you know, somewhere in between with that. All right, so this kind of leads us to this idea of eye color. Eye color is determined by a combination of things. The first thing is the number of melanocytes that are present in the iris. And the second is the presence of the melanin granules in the pigmented epithelium of the iris. So it's the combination of these two that generate our eye color. Now, I can actually have no melanocytes present. I can only have the melanin granules, and in that case, eyes will be blue. If I have melanocytes, um, I will also have the melanin granules, and then I create this kind of sliding scale of green, brown, and black. As you know, we have different shades based on the number of melanocytes, um, and this gives us an increasing number. So green has less than brown, brown has less than black, so black has the most and green has the least, and that's what determines our eye color. Um, people with albinism have neither melanocytes nor the granules present, and so therefore their eyes aren't even blue. They actually have kind of a pinkish or reddish tone to them. Now, I mentioned the fibrous tunic, tunic a little while ago, so let's talk about exactly what that is. This consists of a, the sclera and the cornea taken together. It functions to provide both mechanical support and physical protection for the eye as an attachment site for the eye muscles and to assist in the processing of our focusing. And we'll kind of talk about that when we get to actually how we focus our eyes. The vascular tunic is a different layer and this consists of the combination of the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. It provides a route for blood vessels and lymphatic vessels that supply the eye tissue with nutrient supply and waste removal. They also help to regulate the amount of light that enters the eye, and it helps to secrete and absorb the aqueous humor. Lastly, the vascular tunic controls the shape of the lens. So what exactly is this aqueous humor? The aqueous humor is a fluid that's secreted by the ciliary body, and this fluid fills the anterior chamber of the eye. And it generates a fluid pressure that helps maintain the shape of the front portion of that eye using a fluid pressure. This fluid circulates through the anterior cavity, so the ciliary body produces it, it circulates through, and then the ciliary body actually reabsorbs um, the aqueous humor as well. Now, we can have problems with this. We can have problems with either overproduction of the aqueous humor or a problem with circulation and reabsorption of the aqueous humor. And that is a condition called glaucoma. What it does is it actually um, creates a problem because it distorts the cornea. And it actually can perme permanently distort the cornea, which can um, actually deprive us of our vision. So this aqueous humor and measuring for glaucoma is actually a very important test um, that your eye doctor will perform on you when you go to see them. Now, that's in the anterior ca cavity or anterior chamber. In the posterior cavity or chamber, we have something called the vitreous humor. 
This is what fills most of the posterior cavity and it is more gelatinous in nature. Its job is to actually maintain the shape of the back part of the eye, so it kind of gives it that round appearance at the back. It also functions to hold that retina against the choroid. The retina and the choroid are actually not attached to each other. So in order for all of those nerve cells to actually obtain the nutrients that they need, they need to be pushed up against that capillary network in the choroid. If the posterior um, cavity or the, the vitreous humor doesn't do that, that's where we end up with a detached retina, and the, that part of the retina can actually die, um, and that's a problem. We, it actually causes us to lose some of our sight. All right, so let's talk about the retina. The retina has two parts to it, two layers. The first one is the pigmented part, and this is an outer layer, so it's towards the outside of the eye, and it is very thin. The neural part is the thick inner layer of the retina. So the neural part is really what is important to us. This contains the photoreceptors that respond to light, and the neurons that actually start processing and integrating the visual information that we receive. Um, it is these neurons that actually start kind of putting together the pieces of the different items that we see with our eyes. Um, because this happens so quickly and so rapidly, it, this has to start almost right away. The last part that the neural part has is blood vessels that help to supply the posterior cavity. Now, the part of the neural layer that lies closest to the pigmented layer contains structures called the rods and the cones. Both of these are photoreceptor cells. Rods are the type of photoreceptor that respond to light and only light. So it's either there or it's not. It doesn't respond to differences in color. This is what provides us with our night vision, which is typically in black and white. Now rods are actually more sensitive, sensitive and will trigger with less stimulation than our cones. Now rods actually get their name because they have kind of a rod shape. Okay, they're kind of blunt and squared off. The other one are the cones. These provide color vision and we have three different types of cones. There are blue, green, and red. And if you look at television sets, for instance, this, these are the three colors that you actually use to typically adjust the color on the television. Um, and that's why, because our eyes really only respond to these, these three colors. Um, these three, uh, these types of photoreceptors respond best in bright light and they are less sensitive. In other words, they need more stimulation in order to fire. Cones. Okay, if rod, rods are shaped like this, cones have kind of a cone or triangle shape at their tip. So, like I said, they are named for the shape of their outer segment that's actually embedded in the pigmented part. Inside of the rods and cones, they have a light-sensitive set of pigments that are made from vitamin A. Now, one of the main pigments that is used is a pigment called opsin. This is a protein, and we have different forms of it found in the rods and each of the three different cone types. And because each opsin protein in the different cones is sensitive to um, different light colors, it's because of the difference in that opsin protein that allows that to happen. So what exactly then is colorblindness? Colorblindness means that we have one or more of the cone types that are either absent or they are non-functioning. They're there, but they're not working for some reason. Typically, this is most common in the red cones. And if the red cones are absent or not functioning, this creates the most common type of colorblindness, which is red-green colorblindness. Now, colorblindness is also a sex-linked trait. So, um, the, the genes for coding for the cones um, are actually on our X chromosomes and Y chromosomes. 
The thing is, we typically find color blindness more commonly in men because they only need one defective gene in order to be colorblind, whereas women need two. All right, so within the retina, the cones and rods are stimulated very similarly to a neuron. Basically, the light comes in, it stimulates that OPS and protein, and that triggers a, an action potential in the rod or cone. They then synapse with a bipolar neuron, and then the bipolar neuron synapse with ganglion cells. The ganglion cells axons then run along the inner surface of the retina and they converge at the optic disc. So they pass out of the eye at the optic disc and create the optic nerve that then goes on to the brain. If you take a look at this diagram, you can kind of see this. Okay. Here is the outside part of the eye or towards the outer part of the eye. So we have the pigmented part of the retina and we have the rods here. You can see they've got the blunt end versus the cones which have the tapered end. Okay, We're not worrying about these horizontal cells. They're basically neuroglia that are there. Um, they synapse with these bipolar neurons that are here which then synapse with these ganglion cells. And you can see the axons then of the ganglion cells kind of come and they bundle as they move along this inner surface here of the retina back towards that optic disc. All right, the other piece that's important with the functioning of light is the lens, or with vision is the lens. This lies behind the cornea, and it is transparent like the cornea. Now, while the cornea was made up of collagen fibers that were clear, the lens is actually made up of cells. These cells are actually wrapped within a capsule. Now, the cells lack organelles, and instead they have been filled with a transparent protein. The lens's job is actually to focus the image or the light rays at the back of the retina. And what we do is we change the shape. So normally it's a sphere, but we change its shape through the pulling of the ciliary body. So what the lens does is it actually takes the light and it bends it to make a focal point for the light rays onto the fovea. We want to aim at the fovea because that's got the area of our clearest, sharpest vision. Now, so the lens is going to change shape depending on the distance to the object. If we are looking at something and focusing on something that is close, the lens will be more rounded. Whereas if something is further away, it will actually be more flattened. If the light is not focused on the retina, or if it's focused on a different spot than the, ret uh, than the retina or a different location other than the fovea, the image will be blurry. And we'll get into why that happens. But first, let's take a look at normal vision. Okay. Here I have an object that I am looking at that is close. So the idea is that the light comes in and the lens bends it and it focuses that right onto my fovea. Look at the shape of the lens right here. It is nice and it's round. It almost looks like a jelly bean. Whereas here, the ciliary muscle has actually flattened the lens because the, the object that I'm looking for is way out here somewhere. So the light rays come in and the lens has changed shape, but it still allows it to focus right at the fovea, right on that inner layer there of the eye. This process of changing shape is called accommodation. Now what happens is though, and this is very interesting, when we actually form the image at the back of our eye, it's upside down and backwards on the retina. And what actually happens is, and we're, we're still not quite sure how this occurs, but the brain actually flips the image to its correct orientation. We believe that because of like the proprioceptors and different joints, um, we can actually tell our orientation in space. So we know that we are not upside down relative to everything else that we see. Um, we know that we are going a certain way by gravity and logic dictates that that's going to be downward towards the center of the Earth. So these images actually show this happening. Okay, I have this image and this one shows it really clearly that it gets flipped upside down. And the picket fence here shows you how it actually flips backwards, left to right. 
and that's because of the working of the lens. Now the lens actually has a problem it can deal with, and that are cataracts. With cataracts, our lens loses its transparency. It also will lose its elasticity, and that just happens to us as we get older. Um, it's one of the reasons why as we get older, many of us have to wear reader glasses or bifocals if we already have glasses, um, and that's because of the loss in elasticity. Cataracts can also result from certain drug interactions, um, injuries, and UV radiation. So you need to make sure that you are wearing your sunglasses year-round um, to protect that. A person can become blind because of cataracts. Because what's happening is, even though the retina fun functions, if it doesn't have any light reaching it, you're not going to trigger the visual response. You can replace a uh, lens with cataracts with an artificial lens. Um, to try to replace the lens with like even a cadaver lens, it can be done, but it's a little bit more difficult simply because you run into rejection issues. And they have found that quite honestly with an artificial lens you get the exact same results with a lot less hassle and without the immunosuppression needed in order to um, transplant a typical organ like that, a cell-based organ. Now, the lens is the source, or not necessarily the source, but the lens is kind of the focus of what we call accommodation problems. So we tend to see accommodation problems first show up for most of us in our distant vision. So when we're looking for, at something that is a little further away from us. First of all, normal vision actually has a medical name, and that is called emetropia. Okay. With emetropia, the image is correctly focused on the fovea on the retina. Now we can have a condition like myopia, which is nearsightedness, and so instead of focusing the image on the retina at the fovea, the light rays actually come together and create a focal point in front of the retina. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Hyperopia is farsightedness, and this means that the light rays are supposed to try are trying to come together so that they will actually meet at a spot that is behind the retina. So they haven't even met yet, um, come together yet to focus by the time they hit the retina. Now there is a specific type of hyperopia due to elasticity, and that is presbyopia. And this is typically where you would actually get some bifocals that um, you may need. Now, myopia and hyperopia can be treated using corrective lenses or surgery to reshape the cornea. They actually won't go in and do anything with the lens because they can't. But by changing the shape of the cornea, they can actually fix the problems um, with your vision. So let's take a look here at a diagram. Looking at letter A, this is normal vision. This is how things are supposed to be. All right, so the light comes in and it actually focuses right here on the retina. Now, in myopia, you have the eye that's kind of become a little flattened or squished. This dotted line is supposed to represent where the retina is supposed to be. And notice that the eye has become more, much more elongated. So as a result, the light rays actually focus, but it's not on the retina, it's in front of the retina. Now, I'm not worrying that you know what a diverging lens is, but this just shows you what happens with lenses that treat myopia. It changes the angle of those incoming rays so that they don't meet where the retina should be, they meet where the retina actually is, and that's what allows us to actually see clearly. It's not that you can't see clearly with myopia, it's just everything's a little bit blurry because the focal point is wrong. It's not where we get our sharpest vision. Hyperopia is kind of the opposite of myopia. If myopia kind of squishes the eyeball and makes it longer, hyperopia actually causes the eyeball to shorten up a bit. Again, the dotted line represents where the retina should be on a normal eye, and you can see that the focal point for those light rays actually happens after the light rays have hit the, the retina. So you put a lens in, again I don't care that you know that it's hyperopia, but you, or that you know that it's a converging lens, and what that does is it changes the angle so that the light rays actually meet right on the retina. 
All right, let's take a look at um, our visual pathway now. So what we're going to do is start with the light entering the eye. Because we need it to enter the eye in order to trigger any of this. It's going to strike a photoreceptor, which is going to be one of our rods or one of our cones. And when that light actually strikes our light or, or our rod or our cone, it's actually going to change the shape of our visual pigment. This is that opsin protein that's inside of our cell. If enough opsin protein changes its shape, it is going to alter the release of neurotransmitter from our rod or cone to its bipolar neuron. And that's actually what going, is going to what start the impulse in those bipolar neurons. So the impulse then jumps to the bipolar neuron and then it jumps again to the ganglion cell. Now, as I showed you before, the ganglion axons exit at the optic disc, so it's going to form the optic nerve. Now, the optic nerve from one eye is going to meet the optic nerve of the other eye at an area on the bottom side of the brain called the optic chiasm. The optic chiasm kind of looks like an X. If we had been able to see them on the sheet brain like I wanted to, that's what you would have seen. It would have looked like two white fibers that were in the shape of a letter X. And those are myelinated axons from the optic nerves. Now at this point, this is where we get that visual integration. All right. What happens here is half of the axons go to the left and half of them go to the right. So what do I mean? All right, so we have our eye here and another eye here. Out of the back of the eye comes our nerves, okay, from the optic nerve there, and we have an optic nerve here, okay. Comes together at that optic chiasm, sorry that's supposed to be blue. Now what happens is when they come together to cross, half of the nerves from the red side jump over to the other side and half of them stay with the red side. So some of them will come, come on, my color didn't change. Some of them will come this way, and some of them will continue and go this way. Same thing happens with the blue. Some of them cross over, and then some of them stay on the same side. All right. So this goes to the processing centers of the brain, but you can see um, each <laughs> hemisphere of the brain, so this goes back to the occipital lobe for processing, each of them receives information from both eyes. Okay, So it's not that it just completely crosses over. Um, half of the axons are going to go to the right hand side and half of them are going to go to the left from each eye. So both sides of the brain receive information from both eyes. This information first goes to the thalamus to filtering, because if we don't need to pay attention to the stimulus, then we don't. And then it gets sent for processing to places like the reflex centers in our brain, our midbrain, as well as our main vision, vision processing center on our occipital lobe. Now, we have a couple of other things that we still haven't really talked about with vision, even with as detailed as we have gotten here. The first thing I want to look at is night blindness. Night blindness happens because of a decrease or depletion of our reserve in vitamin A. That's because vitamin A is used to make that opsin protein, which allows our photoreceptors to actually operate. Now, during the day, uh, because we get such strong stimulation, we get a lot of light coming in, it's any remaining pigment that we have usually is able to get stimulated. 
The problem becomes at night when the light levels are low. There's not enough stimulation to even activate the rods, so we're actually not able to see. Now, we typically treat night blindness with supplements, although it is best to get um, your vitamin A from natural sources like spinach or even carrots. Um, that's one of the reasons why they say carrots give you good vision, uh, is because it does contain good quantities of vitamin A. The other condition we want to take a look at is astigmatism. Astigmatism is caused by a misshapen cornea or lens. And basically, we can actually correct this with lenses or surgery. This is a different type of problem than the myopia and hyperopia. You can have myopia or hyperopia and have astigmatism or not. So it's a separate condition that actually you have to have corrected with your vision. Um, in fact, you know, many people have astigmatism in one eye and not the other uh, because of that just differences in shape. The last thing we want to take a look at is bleaching. Bleaching is what creates a ghost image after you look at something that kind of lingers, like after a um, bright flash, for instance. What happens is um, you go through a period of restoration. After the photoreceptor pigment has changed shape, it needs some time to change back. So what happens with bleaching is when we look at a very intense bright light source like a camera flash, you use or you change the shape of a lot of photoreceptor opsin protein. And it takes a little bit of time for that opsin protein to change back to its normal form so it can be stimulated again. So until that happens, you have that kind of ghost image that follows your eyes around wherever you look, um, like with a camera flash. So it takes, uses lots of pigment, and it just takes our eyes a little bit of time to regenerate them after using so much. So that concludes our look at vision, and in our last segment, um, we will be taking a look at um, our hearing and our equilibrium.